Welcome to this video on differential pairs, and in particular looking at the PCB design basics when we are working with differential pairs. We'll be looking at differential signaling, what constitutes a differential pair, how we can route them, impedance control, tight and loose coupling, as well as matching. I'll be showing you some practical examples along the way, so let's get started. As usual, thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. I'll be showcasing a lot of these differential pair tips using Altium Designer, but of course these tips apply to any ECAT software. If you'd like to test out Altium Designer for yourself, you can go to the link in the description below or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab to get yourself a free trial of Altium Designer. As usual, I can highly recommend another Rick Hartley video on the Altium YouTube channel called What Your Differential Pairs Wish You Knew. A lot of the information in this video is a condensed version of the Rick Hartley video with some practical examples, but I strongly encourage you, even though it's a one hour video, to watch it all the way through so you get a real insight into differential pairs when it comes to PCB design. Oftentimes between interconnects, for example, from microcontroller to a sensor, we might use single-ended signaling. This could be I squared C, SPI, or even just a simple GPIO. In essence, we have an input voltage which we'd like to send along a trace, and we typically will use a driver for that. And we have one trace with a suitable return path, of course, going to the receiver side. The receiver then hopefully just picks up the input and sends it as the output, so it's essentially a buffer. The problem is if we travel longer distances, if we have common mode noise, crosstalk from other signals around, and also in particular ground offsets, as ground is not just a single voltage, so the ground, so to speak, at the driver might be at a different potential to the receiver ground. Thus, adding this ground offset in, we at the output for single added signaling, get our output is the original signal input, so V in, plus this ground offset. And this can be quite harmful in many cases. To get around this ground offset problem, or generally an offset in these signals, we can use differential signaling. Differential signaling comes at the additional cost of needing different drivers and different receivers, and that we need to route an additional line or trace. As usual, for the driver input, we just have a single-ended signal. For example, in a microcontroller, we would have a certain variable which we want to send out with a driver, which is also in that microcontroller. On one of the differential pair traces, we send out V in, well, let's call this V plus, and we send out an inverted signal. Let's call that minus V in. We then have our differential pairs routed somewhere and that then gets received maybe at a sensor, maybe at another processor or microcontroller. The receiver is in effect just a summing amplifier or a difference amplifier. We have one positive input and we have one negative input and these are subtracted from each other to form the output. This is really neat because even if we get the same offset added to V plus and V minus, let's call it VG, our ground offset, if we subtract these two signals at the receiver, then we simply get two times the input voltage in an ideal case. And this is shown by the formula below. Of course, in a non-ideal world, the ground offset will usually be different. We might have skews and different arrival times of these two signals, but still the overall benefit using differential signaling is huge. And in particular for ignoring ground offsets. Again, to sum this up, the benefits of using differential signaling is that we can ignore ground offsets. And this is pretty much the only reason for using them. We'll see that there are differences between PCB differential pairs and, for example, using twisted wire pairs. The reason you might want to use differential signaling is for sensitive signals, which might be subjected to common mode noise and so forth, and useful for signals traveling over long distances. We can see differential signals, and I'll show you a few examples later, used by many different interfaces, buses and protocols, for example, PCI Express, USB, DDR, clocks, strobes, and so forth. There's really only one true differential pair, and that is the twisted wire pair. On the bottom right in the image here, we can see a typical twisted wire, essentially two conductors with insulators around them twisted around each other. Essentially, this constitutes a 3D or three axis system. So any common mode noise apparent in this environment will be equally coupled in each of these lines. And this is what makes it a true differential pair. Both of these lines are subjected to pretty much the same common mode noise or common mode energy. Also, these two lines do not need an additional ground return or return path, so they together are enough to form a transmission line, which is quite different to PCB differential pairs, as we'll see in just a second. So the electric magnetic fields between these two pairs are tightly coupled, and we get a tightly controlled impedance. And remember, the individual lines within this system reference each other and do not require a, another ground conductor, for example. So these are great for ignoring ground offsets and great for rejecting common mode noise. 
In comparison, however, PCB differential pairs, because these are a planar system, not really 3D, they're a lesser system, so to speak, than the twisted wire pair. We'll call them a pseudo differential pair for now, they're a planar two axis system, and I'll show you why in just a second. There's a very different behavior than twisted pair. We have loosely coupled fields between these two traces. On the left bottom side, we can see a cross section of a PCB. We have a positive pair of the differential pair. We have the positive trace and the inverted or negative trace of the differential pair, a dielectric, and then we have a reference plane. And we have a top down view on the right side. I've tried to indicate this on this drawing on the left, we only have minimal coupling between the positive and negative part of this differential pair, and most of the energy or the fields are actually between the individual traces and the reference plane below or wherever the reference plane is. Therefore, each line, so the positive part and the negative part of the differential pair, do not reference each other like they did in the twisted pair, or rather they couple to the reference plane below. So all of the energy is between a single trace and the plane below, and this is typically 80 to 90%. So these are two single-ended systems, single-ended transmission lines, and they require a proper reference, whereas the twisted wire pair did not. As a brief illustration, let's assume we have this cross-section of a PCB, so with the positive and negative part of a differential pair, a dielectric, and a suitable reference plane below. Again, 80 to 90% of the fields couple between the single-ended signals down to the reference plane. So this is electric and magnetic fields. If we have a noise source, which is, for example, to the left now, so far closer to the positive part of the differential pair than to the negative, we can see we have an imbalance of crosstalk. Of course, the noise source on the left will have a far greater influence or different influence to the positive part of the differential pair than to the negative. Therefore, we have different amounts of coupling due to different distances because this is not a 3D interwoven system, so to speak. Regardless, we don't really have a choice when it comes to PCBs. It's not like we can route twisted wire pairs on our PCB. So we'll have to make do with differential pairs in kind of this planar fashion. The next topic I'd like to then cover is impedance. Just like single-ended signals, because in essence, differential pairs on PCBs are single-ended signals, they also have an impedance. And this is important for PCI Express, USB and so forth, where we need to control the impedance. And typically we are looking at single-ended impedance. So if we're examining a single trace with respect to a reference plane, what is that trace's impedance, but also the differential impedance. And those are two parameters we need to control when designing our PCBs. Overall, the differential impedance is simply two times the line impedance, the single-ended line impedance, minus the coupling between the positive and the negative part of this differential pair. It turns out that Z0, which is the single end impedance, is typically a lot larger, of course, 80 to 90%, than the coupling impedance. So the differential impedance is largely determined by the coupling from the single ended traces to the reference plane or planes if it's microstrip or strip line. The coupling, essentially how close we are routing our differential pair between each other, so the positive and negative side, determines the Z coupling or the coupling impedance. On the images below, on the left hand side, we can see we have fairly closely spaced traces of a certain width. In the middle, we have the same spacing, but we have wider traces. And on the right side, we have the same trace which as, as the first image, but wider spacing. So take a moment to think which one of these will have the highest differential impedance, how the single end impedance changes and so on. Comparing the first image on the left to the middle image, the wider traces give larger capacitance. Since we have the same distance or height of dielectric, it means a larger capacitance means a lower single end impedance. So the middle image gives us a lower Z0 and therefore a lower differential impedance. If we look on the right hand side, compare that to the first image, we have a wider spacing, which means we have less of Z coupling. Overall, the point is that the single ended impedance times two is approximately the differential impedance, but we can make that smaller by increasing our coupling, so keeping our differential pairs closer together. The question is, why would we want tighter coupling? Is there any benefit to doing tighter coupling, so having the differential pair closer together versus spaced further apart? In essence, just changing the coupling, because if we put our traces together closer, for the same differential impedance, this changes the single-ended line width or the track width. Therefore, for tighter coupling, we can actually get away with using a narrower line, so single-ended line per given impedance. This will give us more space to root, which in a lot of systems is more useful, but also it might be harder to manufacture. Let me show you an example now in Altium Designer using the impedance calculator.
Here we are in Altium Designer, and this is one of my example PCBs I have open, which is an FPGA-based hardware accelerator, contains DDR, PCI Express, and so on. Here we can see rooted a strip line, some differential pairs, and we'll go into the length matching later as well, of the PCI Express traces. I can go to Design, Layer Stack Manager to examine my stack up, and then also look at the impedance calculator. Going to the bottom to impedance, you can see I've set up three different impedance profiles. One is for a single ended 50 ohm trace, one is for differential 85 ohms, and one is for differential 100 ohms. Looking at the 50 ohm single ended first of all, to give me about 50 ohm single ended impedance on a microstrip trace, so the top layer, I need about 0.08 millimeters. If I make the trace width wider, I will decrease my impedance. So I can type in 0.15, for example, and that gives me 35 ohms. So I've chosen 0.08 millimeters because I need to root fairly fine traces to get past all the BGA lands. So let's assume 0.08 millimeters is our 50 ohm trace impedance. The PCI Express standard typically wants 45 ohm single-ended trace impedance and 85 ohm differential impedance. And this is why I have my 85 ohm differential pair here. I've used my width, which is just the trace width of one part of the differential pair at 0.08 millimeters. This is because it's around 45 to 50 ohms, which is what I want as my single ended impedance. However, now I also have my trace gap because this is a differential pair, which I can play around with. At 0.13 millimeters, I get about 85 ohms, which is right on target for my PCI Express differential trace. Remember, most of the Z diff or the differential pair impedance is governed by the width of the single ended line. The trace gap essentially just determines Z coupling. If I want to make Z coupling smaller, then of course I have to space my traces further apart. So if I type in 0.3 millimeters, we have less Z coupling, and therefore we have a higher differential impedance for the same single ended line. Of course I can bring my trace in far closer, so 0.1 millimeters, so increase my coupling, and I get a lower impedance because I'm subtracting more from Z naught. If I go to 0.13 millimeters, I'm pretty much on 85 ohms differential impedance. If I do an extreme example and move the trace gap to one millimeter, you can see the impedance is about 94, 95 ohms. And because we have almost no coupling now in the differential pair, this differential impedance is pretty much just two times Z naught or two times my single ended impedance, which was two times 47, which is 94 ohms. So the trace gap just determines my coupling. So let me move that back to 0.13 and this gives us 85 ohms. Again, we can play around with the trace width. If we make it larger, for example, 0.1 millimeters, this has a much larger effect on the differential impedance, again, because differential pairs in PCBs are largely and predominantly determined by the single ended traces and their single ended impedance. So I think this is a nice thing to play around with to try and get a feeling between Z0 and Z coupling. A last slide on impedance, Z0 or a single ended impedance is usually dictated with a plus minus 5%, plus minus 10% tolerance by the standard. So USB will want 50 ohm single ended impedance, Ethernet as well usually, and PCI Express, depending on the generation of PCI Express, typically around 45 ohm single ended. And we can use that information then to calculate our single ended track width. So this is what would be my first step is to determine the single ended impedance, and that will also be my trace width, even for differential pairs. The spec, and I'll show you in a second, for example, a data sheet, will then also suggest a recommended differential impedance. So we figured out our Z naught, which gives us single ended, and then we need to figure out the spacing. And this is again, Z coupling. We use the differential impedance spec to adjust the spacing between the traces. For example, this layout guideline for PCI Express Gen 4 by Texas Instruments, if we go to the second page, we can see the various frequencies, the various generations of Gen 1 to Gen 4 PCI Express run at. We can see the trace impedance for Gen 1 and 2 is 100 ohms plus minus 5% differential and 50 ohms single ended for plus minus 5% differential. PCI Gen 3 and Gen 4 are different at 85 ohms and 42 and a half ohms. So again, my suggestion is start with a single ended impedance, calculate what trace width you need, and then change the trace spacing by the differential impedance target. When talking about differential pairs, especially when it comes to PCB design, we of course need to talk about matching. Typically this is called length matching, but the more accurate term should be time matching. For differential pairs, we have two different matching mechanisms. One is intrapair and one is interpair. Intrapair is the skew within the differential pair, so between the positive and the negative trace. You can see this on the left bottom hand side. In, within this PCI Express receive pair, I have one trace which is longer generally because of the way it's rooted, so I have to extend the other part of this trace using these meanders. The intrapair skew should be kept as small as possible. 
typically less than 5 picoseconds, less than 10 picoseconds. And this is dictated by the standard as well. So you want to match your intra-pair skew very well, so there's pretty much no skew. On the other hand, there is inter-pair skew, and this is shown on the right side here. Essentially, for example, with PCI Express times four, I might have four sets of differential pairs. So I might have RX0, RX1, RX2, and RX3. Now for PCI Express, this isn't that important to match between them, but for other buses, there might be. And essentially the interpair skew is after you've matched the intrapair skew is matching the interpair skew. So between different sets of differential pairs. So this could be the same group or the same bus. And this interpair matching is typically more lenient. So that might be 10 or 100 or a nanosecond or more even. And this again depends on the protocol, bus or interface. Again, looking at the TI layout guidelines for PCI Express, we can see the intra-pair skew, so within a differential pair, between the positive and negative side, they've given it in length. And I prefer if people give it in picoseconds, nanoseconds, but this is constrained to about five mils, so five thousandths of an inch, so rather tight. On the other hand, the inter-pair skew, so between RX0 and RX1 and RX0 and RX2 and so on, there's no specification. You can route them pretty much however you want, and this was the point that intrapair skew is usually more important than interpair skew. In my project in Alton Designer, you can see I've done both. I have these meanders to do interpair skew, so although not strictly required by the PCI Express recommendations, but I also have more importantly the interpair skew. The way I can do that, if I just get rid of this, is go to my PCB tab on the left hand side, click on one of my net classes I set up, for example, RX0 over here we can see we have different signal lengths and therefore different time delays. So these are not within, for example, five picoseconds. So I want to try and match them as closely as possible. The negative part is at 395 and the positive part is about 402. So I could either delete part of the trace and try and do this manually, for example, adding meanders like this, but this isn't great. Also, when you're meandering, you want to still try and keep your meanders as short as possible as to not mess up the impedance profile too much. In Altium, I can go to the root tab at the top and then do interactive length tuning. Click on the trace I want to tune. And on the right hand side in the properties tab, I can change the style of my miters or my meanders. So I can change the spacing, make it larger, smaller, and so on. And on the left hand side, you can watch the delay change as I drag this around. So I'll use this to then match the delays. For example, this might be close enough. I'm not making too much of an excursion away from the other differential pair side. If I want to match between, so inter-pair matching, I would go to root, interactive differential pair length tuning, so differential pair length tuning, click on any side of the differential pair, and again on the right hand side I can change my mitre, I can change my spacing, and so on. So I can adjust this, of course you don't want to have spacing like so, which is far too close to other, other pairs or other traces, I don't want them too close to any holes, so this is all the things you have to take into account. Also, I don't want to make my spacing, for example, this small, because I can have crosstalk within the lines, for example. So my spacing should be reasonable. Again, the normal rules apply, 3H spacing and so forth. Lastly, and just very briefly, we also need to talk about termination when it comes to differential signaling, as termination, especially at the speeds nowadays, for example, PCI Express, DDR and so on, is definitely needed. We need to terminate our transmission lines to avoid reflections, ringing, and so on. Reflections and ringing can cause both EMI issues because of the higher increased frequency content and also signal integrity issues or SI issues due to ringing, reflections, and so on. A useful formula is the reflection coefficient. If we have mismatched impedances between transmission lines and, for example, a load impedance or our receiver, and this is given by the ratio of ZL minus Z0, so the load impedance minus the trace impedance, for example, divided by ZL plus Z0. Ideally, we want the transmitter impedance to equal the transmission line impedance to equal the receiver impedance. And this is for perfect power transfer and to minimize our reflections. And again, increasing the signal integrity and reducing EMI issues. If we, for example, plot this reflection coefficient versus the load impedance, so for a given trace impedance, let's say 50 ohms, if at our receiving end we have a mismatch in load impedance, we can see what happens. So on the x-axis we have the load impedance, on the y-axis we have our reflection coefficient. This can be positive or negative depending on the nature of the reflection. Given that our Z0 is 50 ohms typically in a single-ended system, we can see if the load impedance is matched to 50 ohms, that is we have proper termination, our reflection coefficient is zero, we have no reflections, we have perfect power delivery or power transfer. If our load impedance is higher than our trace impedance, let's say 100 ohms, 1000 ohms and so on, we can see we get positive reflections going back. So our reflection coefficient grows. 
On the other hand, if we have a load impedance that is lower, so less than 50 ohms, 40, 30, 20, 10, or even zero ohms, we get a negative reflection coefficient going down to minus one when our load is zero. So a perfect short, for example. In any case, we can usually control the transmission line impedance, again, using our calculations of trace width relative to the dielectric thickness, reference planes, and so on. The transmitter impedance, we can usually get from data sheets, models, and so on, but we can get around the receiver impedance. If it isn't matched, it's usually rather high, maybe kilo ohms receiver impedance. What we need to do is place a resistor, which is the same as the transmission line impedance in parallel between those lines. Of course, there's various other termination schemes, but this is the most simple one. We can have series termination schemes where we have a series resistor placed at the output of the transmitter. We can have parallel termination schemes, which are the easiest. We have DC, which we just have just a single resistor tied to a suitable voltage. Or AC, where we also use capacitors in combination resistors. I'm briefly just glancing over this. This is definitely a topic for another video and could be probably as long as this video itself. Just as an example, I have an FPGA on this board and that is connected via DDR3 and the address command and control signals will have a clock. This is routed as a 100 ohm differential pair and is routed on the bottom layer as a micro strip, again with skew matching, going into my DDR memory, which is on the other side. But right here, we have this termination resistor, which is the same value as the differential impedance, so 100 ohms, and that's placed right at the end of the chain, so to speak, and this is again to minimize reflections. Thank you very much for watching this brief overview of differential pairs when it comes to PCB design. I hope you can implement some of these tips into your own future designs and make sure to check out that Rick Hartley video I mentioned at the beginning. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel, leave a like if you like the video and a comment if you have any questions. Thanks again for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye.